All right, we are live. Another week, another MMFM Digital. I'm your host, J.L. Martinez. Of course, I always want to thank our amazing supporters, Camacol, its president, Joe Chi, and of course, my partner in crime in all of this, the great Patricia Arias, who is also the chief executive and executive director of Camacol. Uh, we always thank both of you from the bottom of our hearts for making all of this possible every week. We have an amazing show today, a great interview with one of the top Hollywood directors in television and film. He has a feature film coming up called Pearl. We're going to talk all about that great film that he has, uh, which will be released, I believe, in August. And it's going to be a fantastic interview. But before we get to him, a couple of quick news and notes, as we always do. Uh, a couple of stories in the trades this week. The WGA and the Hollywood Studios looks like they are making headway. There will be a deal potentially reached to extend their contract, which I believe expired uh, just a couple days ago. And I think that's great because now the writers can get back to their true love, which is fighting their agents. Um, other than that, the coronavirus spike is uh, wreaking havoc still on the industry. It looks like domestic jobs will be slow to come back. Uh, as opposed to our friends in Europe across the pond, it looks like they'll be able to actually ramp up a lot sooner uh, than we will stateside. Obviously, here uh, we just had a, a dim report from Dr. Fauci recently, and that looks like it's going to delay any sort of production domestically, at least in a significant level. I know that some smaller shows have gone. Uh, some telenovelas down here in Miami are planning to go. But as far as the major film and TV productions, we're just going to have to wait it out a little bit longer. Uh, obviously, my advice is always wear the mask. Let's really try to bend that curve so we can all get back to the work that we love. And speaking to things that we love, uh, you know, this has become a little staple just before I bring Bobby on is that, uh, you know, you guys have asked me what I listen to before. I always say it is Spanish music and now obligatory. I have to do a few bars of uh, the song that I was listening to prepare today. Uh you know, hopefully I'll get a little better reviews than when we did Celia Cruz last week. But this is uh, a couple of bars here from Mark Anthony's uh, Vivir Mi Vida. And let's see what kind of comments we get this week. So I'm just going to give it a whirl here and see how we do. Voy a reír, voy a bailar, vivir mi vida, la, 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 la. Voy a reír, voy a gozar, vivir mi vida, la, 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 pues llega la lluvia para limpiar las heridas, a veces solo una gota puede vencer la sequía. ¿Y para qué llorar? ¿Pa' qué si duele una pena su vida? ¿Y para qué sufrir? ¿Pa' qué si así es la vida? ¿Y qué es vivirla? La, la, le. Voy a reír, voy a bailar, vivir, vivir, la, 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 la. Okay, I think that's enough of that. How are you, Bobby? <laughs> I'm well, thanks. I enjoyed your performance. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's not American Idol, but you know, like I said, I'm just trying to always just beat myself from the week before. That's my only competition. <laughs> so here we are, but thank you so much. You know, legendary Bobby Roth, you've done so much great work. Uh, and I know that you have been to Miami in the past and, you know, you've spoken with a lot of our filmmakers here. So I really appreciate you you're taking the time uh, to do this live interview with us here for MMFM Digital. Thank you so much, Bobby. No, thank you. And uh, I definitely want to give a quick shout out to to Monica Rosales, who introduced us, uh, you know, who's often you see one of our local, uh, you know, uh, film organization leaders here as well in the community, uh, who's also done great work. So thank you, Monica. Uh, we're really looking forward to this chat today. So so, Bobby, you are an L.A. guy born and raised, right? Yes. Yes. I live one block from where I was born. Oh, wow. There you go. So you, you did not move far from home. That's I guess it's a good thing. When I moved and came back. Gotcha. And uh, so, you know, you studied, initially you went to Berkeley, correct? Uh, yes, I went to Berkeley in the 70s, which was an interesting time to be at Berkeley. And then I, uh, I wanted to be a novelist, but I didn't have it. And I didn't like being alone. 
So right. I came back to LA and went to film school at USC for a year. And then I went to graduate school at UCLA. In oh, film. wow. And so initially the idea is that you wanted to be a film director, correct? That was the, the main, and that's what you did for the first sort of, you know, several years out of, out of college. Yeah. yeah I, I actually um, wanted to be a documentary filmmaker, mm. uh, which is why I went to film school and it was a very political time. And uh, I was thinking about the first film I made in film school at UCLA and how everything is so secular because uh, it was a documentary about the Watts Writers Workshop after the Watts Riots. Uh, mm. I'm probably the only one of your listeners old enough to uh, remember the the burning of Watts in 1966. Oh, wow. um, but it had a had a big impact, and so I went down there in '72 uh, to see uh, how the money that had been put into the community had had fared, and uh, made a documentary about how the programs had flourished for a short time and then people lost interest and then they pulled the money and everything was back to the way it was. Mm. And I'm hopeful that this time we'll learn from that. Right. No, of course. It's interesting how, you know, these stories that, you know, sort of come back into into the fold now. And, and uh, you know, obviously you, uh, you know, made some great films. You, uh, you know, were in some great festivals. Uh, and then, you know, I know that we talked a little bit before you, you, you did come to Miami. I think what originally was like in the late 70s, right? Or early 80s. Yeah, I, I, I think one of my first film festivals was the Miami International Film Festival that mm. I think came the Virgin Islands Film Festival later. Or, oh, wow. Or the other hand, I'm not sure. Uh, but, uh, and I'd never been to a festival, and uh, I brought my little movie, The Boss's Son, and it won the grand prize. So oh, wow. Was, Miami was a very big deal for me. Yeah, no, of course. And that's, you know, that's great that you can create that connection. And then, you know, of course, you know, and, and we have talked about this, you know, leading up to the interview that you were, uh, you know, a director and, you know, a show that's very dear to our hearts, Miami Vice, during the first season, you directed an episode of that. And that was actually your, your first major TV directing assignment. It was my, it was my first anything television. I right. didn't know what I was doing. I, I just did it because I was friends with Michael Mann. Hmm. And he invited me, and because I had never done television, I didn't know that you have to shoot close-ups. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, so, it's right. So it was it was a it was a learning process. Right. No, I, I can imagine. But I think what's kind of interesting and something that I think stood out to me, you know, in Michael Mann's work with Miami Vice, is that it did feel a little more cinematic and a little less formulaic than the shows that were sort of popular at the time, right? Yeah, I think that's why he asked people like me and people who came from movies to, mm. to come down. And he encouraged uh, visuals and he used music in a way that nobody at that time had done on television. So it was right. A, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that was a very exciting time. And, you know, it's funny because here, even today, 30, 40 years later, uh, we still sort of think of Miami Vice as what really helped to create what folks think of Miami now you know, in terms of the culture and in terms of mm -hmm. the fashion and the beach and all the fun things about Miami. It went from this sort of sleepy retirement village into like this sort of mecca of hot young people almost overnight. And a lot of it, mm -hmm. I think, was due to the show, right? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. And then obviously, you know, you continue to make your films, but then you, you sort of got the TV bug as well. So you went on to direct a slew of incredible TV series. Uh, and so, you know, how to sort of in your career, because I know, again, you started as a filmmaker, as a documentary filmmaker and, you know, doing television and knowing how the TV industry has evolved over the years. Uh, how has it been in terms of your career and your journey seeing, you know, both your work uh, on, on sort of television and how that industry has evolved over the past, you know, couple decades? I think I think there's basically two kinds of filmmakers. There's people who have very specific thing to say, and they will only say their message. And then there are people, uh, and I think I fall into this uh, latter category, that like to work. Hmm. And so what I always saw film, uh, film and television for was, and particularly TV, to do a lot of work and to learn. Right. And especially given the diversity of choices in TV where you could do, I would fill out a season. I would have Grey's Anatomy, Lost, Prison Break, 
criminal minds, the mentalist, and they were all different. Hmm. And the, the people were different. Um, the actors were very different. The style of the show was different. And I got to experiment. And it always would come back into my personal movies because I used to feel like I, it, at first I thought I would do one for them and then one for me. Right. And then it became three for them and one for me. And then it became <laughs> five for them and one for me. Uh, at, at which point, uh, sometimes I would go years without making a personal independent film because I was making a living in television. Right. No, obviously. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it, it means it's, it's hard because like you said, you know, it it's constant work and you're always out there and, you know, there is sort of creative leeway in the sort of television space. But, you know, it's different than when you're making your, your own independent film. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a challenge because I had been um, such a loner and, and a little bit of a maverick that having to go and follow other structures and especially if you go on a show like i went into Grey's anatomy i think it's 11th year oh wow you won't go to invent the show in its 11th year coming in to direct for three or four weeks right um so you have to kind of um when i did lost i came in in the third year and i watched 55 episodes of the show in three days wow. before i went Wow. Because I wanted to know what they were doing. Mm. And I wanted to bring whatever I could of myself, but it had to be their show. Right. And I mean, you know, and the tricky thing about television is you're a guest. And mm. You're making a movie, especially an independent movie. You're there from the beginning to the end. In TV, somebody was there a week before you and somebody will be there a week after you. And you have to figure out how you fit in. Right. And, and how you interpret their show. Right. And, and most of the time I was pretty good at it. And then there were a few shows I did. I shouldn't have done because I wasn't good at it. Like Beverly Hills 90210. I, I went and did that show because a friend of mine was the executive producer and I was bad at it. Hmm. Cause I liked the aesthetic. I didn't, I, I tried to hold on to my own personality and, um, and at one point, he accused me of turning Beverly Hills 90210 into a Sam Shepard play. <laughs> <laughs> and it was not, and he didn't mean that as a compliment. Right. Even though I like Sam, I like Sam Shepard plays. But, sure. Um, so you have to kind of pick the show that meets your personal aesthetic, you know? And right. I think the, the first one I did that I really connected with was Prison Break. Okay. I, I like everything about the show. I like the actors. I like the writers. I like the energy of the show. Um, it was in many ways close to an independent film because it did a lot of handheld work and a lot of stuff on the front. Right? And um, that was the aesthetic of the show. Mm. And I liked it. And so I was good at it. And I ended up doing uh, 14 of them. Oh, wow. You know? Right. Yeah, so you were, yeah. you know, you could tell in the body of work that you, for that particular show, that you really kind of responded on a creative level, right? Yeah, and I felt, obviously, when you come back to a show, you feel less like a guest. You feel, you know, you know the habits, you know the, the personalities, uh, you get a much better sense of how to talk to the actors, because the two leads in that show, who are both friends of mine to this day, Dominic Purcell and Wentworth Miller, are very different human beings mm. and they were friends, but you can't direct them the same way. Right. And so the first time you come in, there is no cookie cutter approach. You have to get to know them and see what works for one and then what works for the other one and, and try to, you know, try to figure out, okay, so how's that going to work when you stage the scene? There are all kinds of questions like who's close ups to shoot first, and that affects where you're going to put the camera for the master. Right. And these are things you just don't get this the first time you do a show. Right. And especially if you have a lot of experience in television, you're just thinking you're making your movie and you're trying to tell your story. And then you find out wait a minute, this has been going on for years. You hmm. need to get on their, on their way. Yeah, on their wavelength. And it's interesting because. Yeah. When you are directing your own feature and and when you're working with the same crew and the same cast over the shoot of a film it's like you know the first few days everyone's kind of getting together they're kind of figuring it out and then slowly the production gets into a rhythm right 
but yeah. when you're in a well-oiled machine like a TV series that's gone two, three, four seasons, you know that rhythm has already been established, and so like you're running in maybe like a musician trying to pick up the beat and keep pace, right, with everybody else, you know. Yeah, and <clears throat> and the prep period on a movie can go on for a couple months. The prep right. period on a television show is at most seven days. Right. And so what you have to get good at is getting it fast. Of course. Get yeah. the rhythm. So the way, uh, I don't know if this is, is interesting to you guys, but the way TV shows are organized usually is that people are booked. Hmm. Uh, network shows, maybe months in advance, the, the booking period can be, you know, May, it ends the beginning of June. Right. And then the shows start up the end of July or into August. Hmm. And so when you sign up for a show and you're booked on a show, you have no idea what the screenplay is. Right. You just, you're doing number 15 or you're doing number nine. And then a lot of it is the luck of the draw. You get the script. Some scripts are better than others. And that often determines how much they like the director. And I was very lucky when I came to Lost, I did episode 20 of the third year and it was supposed to be the finale. So it was written by the showrunners. It was mm. a great script. A lot happened. Right. A lot of there was a lot of responsibility, but there was a lot of great stuff. And the actors that it featured were, I think, two of the best actors on the show, uh, Michael Emerson and Terry O'Quinn. Mm. Uh, and I knew Terry because he was in my Miami Vice, which was his right. first television show. Right. And, um, and it, it turned out great. Now, some of it was because I did a good job, but a lot of it was because it was just a very good script. Yeah. No, and that's it's, right. it's luck, you know. Yeah, you can get a lesser script. You know, not all those scripts are equal, and it's much much bigger challenge for the director. Yeah, no, absolutely, and it's, it is fascinating how that that process is different between you know directing a film, directing a television. But again, throughout this whole process, even though, like you said, you got to a five to one ratio, you have continued to to direct feature films, and I know that you you've worked on a few recently, including one that's coming up now that I'd like to spend a couple minutes on, uh, called Pearl. Right. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to uh, show our audience the trailer, if you don't mind, first, and then we'll talk about it after. So Great. give us a second. And this is Pearl, directed by Bobby Roth. Why do you think Winston is a good fit for Pearl? The individual attention you have for the girls makes you a wonderful fit, as you would say. Pearl is a magnificent girl, a 4.4 GPA, an accomplished pianist, well-liked by her teachers, popular with her friends. They were fighting. And then Anthony shot Maul. And then he shot himself. Jack Wolf? Yeah. It's Isaac Robbins. I'm representing Helen Rosen's estate. She was killed last night. The funeral's Friday. It's important that you be there. It's authentic. I don't, I don't think so. Helen never told me anything about this. I haven't even met her. I just wanted to offer my condolences. You knew my mom? A long time ago. I was crazy about her. What do you want? Are you my father? Why would you ask me that? You're not sure, are you? For all I know, she could be your daughter. Look, I don't want you to be that girl's father. To be honest, I don't understand what Helen ever saw in you. Mom, why didn't you tell me about him? Where are you going to sleep? Downstairs on the couch. So much. Pearl has gone through an incredible trauma. The Winston program would only add to her stress. I am sorry. I don't think you are. I've enrolled you in his local public school. Winston is my school. I'm not going there. It's not there. your school now, is it? God, I hate you. It should have been you that huh? died. Can you just give me a chance to, like, learn how to do this? Since you died, people have avoided me. It's like I'm damaged. Let's get out of here. Come on. I have to show all of them I'm doing well. Need help? His name is Zach, and he's way old, but I think he liked me. My friend thinks you're very handsome. I got a job. When do you leave? I'm not going anywhere. No one will ever love me that way again. 
know you miss her. I'm afraid I'll forget. We'll get through this together. Wow, looks great. I want to see it. Um, <laughs> what was the what was the inspiration for that film? Um, it's a it's a mix of things. I, I wanted to do a story. I'd done a lot of father son movies, and I wanted to do a father daughter movie. Hmm. And um, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of the story comes well. Some of the story comes from my own sister, who who was killed and left uh, in her oh, case no. sons. And um, and they uh, came to live with me afterwards because oh, there was wow. nowhere to go. So some of that inspired me too. And uh, um, but it's it's mostly just wanting to tell a story about love hmm. and uh, and finding love. Right, right, yeah. And it's that's you know definitely you you feel like there's a personal connection. And I'm, I'm so sorry for your family. And but you know you you feel like there is something very personal going on in that film as. You know, I think a lot of times when you get into the film world, something that sometimes you can't do in television, like you said, when things are moving at their own speed and someone else is writing, you know, the film world, particularly the indie film world, you know, I think the best stories tend to be the most personal ones. Uh, and, you know, you can definitely feel that. And in terms of cast, it seems like you did use some actors from the TV world. Like how, how did you approach the casting of them? Yeah, just, you can just see there, there's Ming-Na from uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. There's right. Hester Carbonell from Lost. There's Sarah Carter, who I'd worked in uh, TV movies with, who was the star of Falling Skies. Uh, J. August Richards from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, I, I tried to go to the people I had worked with over the years who were the best actors. And, and, uh, and the challenge, the biggest challenge was in casting the, ch the younger people because they were all new, you know, mm. Lars Thompson, who I think is wonderful, uh, had never been the lead in a movie before. Right. And, uh, and, uh, so that was taking a bit of a chance, but I'd been lucky because, uh, I did a movie called Baja, Oklahoma many years ago, and I, I had to pick an 18-year-old girl, and I picked this girl named Julia Roberts, who had never acted either. So, Wow. And, and I worked with Elizabeth Moss from Handmaid's Tale when she was 12. I wow. Demi Lovato when she was 13. Hmm. And I would say I've been really lucky finding young young women right before they break. Yeah. And But I never had one play the lead in a movie. Hmm. So... You know, but Larson did amazing. Yeah, no, you could tell it's great. And so, uh, you know, <clears throat> we were discussing a little bit like, you know, and, and we'll get a little bit into current events. And I mentioned it briefly in the intro that, you know, unfortunately, this whole pandemic has sort of changed the way not only we're making films, they're not making films right now, but also in terms of marketing and distribution and the festival world. I had a film at the Miami Film Festival this year, a feature. Fortunately, our premiere was the opening weekend, but the festival literally got cut in half. It was shut down halfway through the I festival. Heard, I, I heard that, wow. Yeah, so we were, again, very lucky that we were in the opening weekend, but felt so bad for so many of my colleagues that some of them had flown in from Latin America and LA and all over the world. And it quickly went from, okay, you know, how are we planning the after party and the premiere and the whole red carpet to how do we get everybody safely home? Uh, and, you know, as you can imagine, just a crazy situation. So, you know, sort of what's been the strategy with Pearl and, you know, where can folks see it? Um, Pearl uh, may benefit from the pandemic, uh, ironically, um, because there's going to be a big dearth. <clears throat> It comes out in August, and people haven't been able to shoot for the last couple months, so I think right. there aren't going to be as many films available. It's going to be on uh, a number of platforms, certainly iTunes, uh, Fandango, Comcast, uh, Cox, um, and then that'll be the initial uh, August 11th, and then later uh, possibly Netflix. It'll be, I think, available on Amazon also. Okay. Uh, in you know, um, so it, it'll be really interesting. It's a it's a whole different world since I released a feature, uh, an independent feature of my own, because I'm used to the long lead time and magazines and and uh, and film. Mm. And uh, 
it's it's all digital now right. and uh, so shows like this are really important for getting the word out mm. and social media you know uh larson is a very popular model and hip-hop dancer and she's got you know 900,000 800 and something thousand uh followers on instagram may has 900,000 right um my brother-in-law Springsteen, who played guitar and his wife did a lot of the songs has a million followers so we're going to see what the social media does for us uh, yeah and that's interesting that pointed out because of, of the way that the you know distribution and marketing now has changed but so much like you said is done through social media and you know i'm wondering if you know uh, like i said a time like this where so many folks are at home, you know, uh, particularly in our industry cannot get back to work, but, you know, we have so much time to see content. And, and I think having a finished product is an asset now because you have something to show the world. And the fact that your cast does have such a strong following, uh, you know, I think will definitely help in terms of the, the overall promotion uh, of the piece. And, and I guess it kind of brings us to the last point is sort of, you know, what, how do you see the industry, obviously in the near term, and in the long term, knowing that in the midst of this pandemic, pandemic, um, there has been so many more options for viewing content. You know, so many streaming platforms. We just got HBO Max. We just got Disney Plus back in the fall. Obviously, Netflix is a behemoth. Amazon Prime, uh, more to come. Peacock. Uh, how do you see the viewers changing their viewing habits, and also how do you see your work evolving in this new time? Well. Well, I'm excited because I think it always comes back to the story and the acting. I mean, the things that have not changed in 45 years of filmmaking are you need a good piece of writing and you need good players. Mm. And, and so there is a little bit more of a democratic feeling for me that I'm watching stuff from all over the world. I watched a show that I would never have known about called Normal People mm. from Ireland. And it's it's a beautiful, very personal show. And somebody said it to me, it was word of mouth. So it's like the old days. A friend that says, you should see Ozark. Right. You know? Right. And and you watch the show and you and you respond to what? You respond to great acting and great writing. Mm -hmm. um, I think for a while movies got so big with action and special effects. But the great thing about streaming is that it's, it, it brings everything down to a level playing field where story and emotion, um, I just like the reality of the children. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I am, we're all working from home. <laughs> yes, and, um, but, but I think that um, people get to get exposed you can take a, a chance, like maybe you weren't going to go spend $16 and I wasn't going to get the kind of advertising to have you go to the cinema and get a babysitter and, and end up having an evening for $100 to see Pearl. Mm. But you can go on iTunes and take a chance for a few bucks right? and and be hopefully pleasantly surprised mm. and and discover things. And I think one of the, there aren't many blessings to this pandemic, but one of them might be that people are discovering other modes. Yeah, you know, no, no they're absolutely. Out walking, they're maybe out walking more. They're definitely, I find a lot of communication like this. And while I don't like it as much as personal contact, um, I can bring guests, I teach at Art Center College in Pasadena, and I can ask anybody I know in the world to come online for 15 minutes or half an hour from their home, like we're doing, mm. and expose my students to somebody that they may never get to get in their car and schlep to the school. Right. So I think we have to, you know, try to find, you know, new exposures. And I right. think that independent films may get more of a chance. And people right. may find that it, it, it helps to cha uh, change the tastes right. of the popular. 
No, you're right. And I think that, you know, yeah, you're right. I think that culture and elevating taste. And like I said, it's, it's not all about the big tentpole movies that are, you know, have the advertising budgets of the new Cadillac nowadays, you know, they spent 200 million on the movie, another 150 million in, in advertising. You know, I think that you said you're right, you know, with this new sort of streaming world that we've all kind of been forced into so acutely in the last three months, we are discovering a lot of new content, a lot of new voices, uh, my partner, Patty, introduced me to an Italian series called Curan, which I absolutely loved. Uh, it's kind of like a teen thriller. I, I, I think I would compare how it to... You, how do you say that? What was it again? C-U-R-O-N. It's uh, it's like a teen thriller. I would say, if I had to describe it, it's like uh, The Shining meets Stranger Things, is how I would pitch it. See, this is great. This is what I'm, this is what I'm talking about. I mean, and that's what I'm hoping for Pearl, that people... Mm in somewhere who would never go to see this movie or would never even get into let's say a small town and somewhere else in florida right that everybody can see it and it, mm -hmm. it might not be playing in the local cinema which only has you know star wars 14 right but now they they can they they have the freedom to you know find something new Absolutely. And and I'm so glad that, again, you know, that you were introduced into our world and we were able to talk a little bit about Pearl before its release. And I, I do want to reemphasize to everyone, I hope you go out and not go out, I guess, go in, stay in <laughs> <laughs> and stream uh, Pearl. I'm definitely going to be doing that. Uh, I think it's, you know, it looks like a really, really interesting story. So I'm excited. And, you know, I just, I really, you know, the, the half hour has flown by so quickly. I wish we had more time, but uh, we may have to bring you on the podcast eventually and do a little bit yeah. longer form. That would be great. But, you know, obviously I want to thank you again, Bobby, for taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So don't go away. I'm just going to put you on hold one second uh, and we will sign off. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is another MMFM Digital in the can, digitally speaking. So until the next time, and uh, you may or may not hear my kids in the background, depending on what else is going on in the house. I am J.O. Martinez, your host. This has been another MMFM Digital. And until the next time, as I always say, 